Hello, and welcome to the Innovations in Energy Efficiency webinar series. This session is entitled 2021 International Energy Conservation Code and Beyond. My name is Mark Reardon, and I'm a social science analyst in the Affordable Housing Research and Technology Division of the Office of Policy Development and Research. The 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, known as IECC, represents the national model for energy efficient residential construction. According to the US Department of Energy, this code is 9.3% more energy efficient than its predecessor and over 33% more efficient than a home built to the 2006 IECC standards. Understanding the measures and prescriptive approaches driving this level of efficiency is critical to design, construct, and improve buildings. In addition to covering the most recent energy code, this webinar will discuss relevant high performance standards and building certification, such as DOE's Zero Energy Ready Homes and EPA's Indoor Air Plus programs. Expert speakers will provide helpful tips and tricks to understand and navigate these newest codes and standards. This session, 2021 International Energy Conservation Code and Beyond, has two parts, a technical portion and a question and answer portion with all of the presenters. Please utilize the Q&A function within Zoom to submit any questions that you have. At the conclusion of the technical program, we will address as many of these questions as we can. We encourage everyone to submit questions throughout the presentations. You do not need to wait until the end to submit your questions. As a reminder, all webinars in this webinar series will be recorded and posted to HUD's YouTube channel. The recorded sessions will be posted approximately two weeks after the conclusion of the webinar series. The first speaker of today's technical program is Rob Salcedo. Rob is a senior research engineer in the Building Energy Codes program. His work focuses on the development and implementation of advanced residential energy codes, including renewable energy technologies, decarbonization, and equity. Take it away, Rob. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining my presentation on the residential provisions of the 2021 IECC. Uh, my name is Rob Salcedo. I'm with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I am in charge of the residential codes program as part of the overall building energy codes program. Um, I was an author of the 2021 IECC determination, determination analysis. And so I'm gonna give you a good or high level overview of what's in the 2021 IECC. One thing I'll say to start off is this is gonna be, this is a high level review. Um, I'm not making any assumptions of anyone's level of understanding of the 2021 IECC. So I'm gonna take it from a very basic level. And then, so I'm sure there'll be things you might be heard of before. So we'll start as we go. Uh, so we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna look at the structure of the IECC, its scope, terminology, and then we're gonna dive into the compliance pathways, how a homeowner or builder would show compliance to the 21, 2021 IECC and what all in, that entails from the mandatory requirements and the testing requirements, um, and then the by building type. So we're gonna look kind of give a good high level look at, uh, at what we're gonna, what's in the 2021 IECC. So first off, why do we care about the IECC? Why do we care about energy codes? Um, and the answer is it gives, it is basically sets the minimum requirements, the minimum energy efficiency requirements that anyone could build a, a building to. So you could not build uh, to any less level. And what that entails is it guarantees to a homeowner that they will have uh, lower energy bills. There's a measure of, of comfort and durability uh, designed into the home. And then for not just for the homeowners, but for the external community, for the utility prog you know, programs, they can know that their the peak loads will be not as high as if anyone could build a, just a really low level home. Um, so it, it guarantees that the cost of building in energy efficiency in a home is, is most cost effective, where if you design a home uh, to a very low efficiency level and then down the road 10, 15, 15 years, you want to build in high, high level energy efficiency, uh, it's much more expensive. It's much more costly to add in the, uh, the new energy efficiency measures. So it is easy to design it and build it at the start when in new construction. So it is much more cost effective. And as you can see, there is a large family of I codes in addition to the International Energy Conservation Code. 
There's building codes, fire codes, plumbing codes, uh, codes to handle all aspects of the building. So let's look at the overall structure of the IECC. And so to start, how is it laid out? So there's two sections. There's a commercial section and a residential section. So they're laid out exactly the same with scope, definitions, general requirements, the actual ener energy efficiency language in chapter four for both. Um, it addresses existing buildings. And then there's the reference standards and appendices with additional information. The, the, the focus of our discussion today is gonna be on the chapter four of the residential section of the code. So the scope, which buildings apply in the residential uh, code? First one is the, res, you know, we got one or two uh, family dwellings, townhouse, townhomes, uh, duplexes. Um, and then we look at the R2, R3 and R4 building types, anything less than three stories, less than or equal to three stories. And as the adage says, if it's not residential, it's commercial. So if it's not scoped as a, uh, sorry, if it's not permitted as a residential building, it would most likely be commercial. And then the classifications R2, R3, R4. R2 uh, is the two, you know, more than two dwelling units. Uh, so apartments, dorms, boarding houses, hotels. R3 includes the, the one and two family uh, dwellings, single family homes. And R4 is the assisted living, residential care uh, type of, of buildings. So this is the scope of the buildings that we're gonna be looking at today. So some buildings, and especially in my area, Boulder, Colorado, there's a lot of mixed uh, construction going on where it's a, it's a combination of residential and commercial. So for these types of buildings, the residential portions of the building are um, under the auspices of the residential code. The commercial portions are under the commercial sections of the code. But the final say has, is up to the code official. If the code official or the jurisdiction deems the whole building as one type or the other, then that's what they would uh, correspond to in the, in the specific energy codes. So as an example, if it's a mixed use building, the jurisdiction permitted as an entirely commercial building, then it would be all under the, the auspices of the commercial code. So there's some terminology we wanna look at um, when we talk about compliance pathways. One is prescriptive. Prescriptive compliance is a very easy compliance path. Uh, it's typically you just show that your uh, building meets the specific envelope requirements um, and then you comply. There's a performance-based approach where you actually look at the actual annual performance of the building uh, with specific assumptions of operation. Does the, the home comply based on a performance-based approach? Uh, and then each one of those has mandatory requirements that must be met no matter what the, how the building performs, even if it performs at an extremely high level, if the mandatory requirements aren't met, then the home would not comply. And we'll, we'll talk a little more in detail of each uh, compliance path as we go along. So uh, just kind of want to give you some high level terminology points. And then there's also an ERI path. It's part of the performance path that we'll talk about a little more. That's a little newer and different approach to compliance uh, based on a, a, another standard. And we'll talk about that more. So the chapter four, we talked about the, the prescriptive requirements. So the prescriptive requirements focus all on the envelope. So it's the, the require, installation requirements of the roofs, walls, foundations, the, the, the quality, the U factors of the windows, door skylights, their solar heat gain coefficient. And then also there are requirements for how leaky the building is. So the infiltration rate and the duct leakage rate must meet certain requirements. And those are part of the mandatory requirements we talked about in the last slide. The performance-based alternatives, uh, there's two. There's a total building performance compliance and an energy rating index compliance, ERI. Um, and those are based on the performance of the building and they're compared to a standard reference building. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here as we get into the details. And then the mandatory requirements. These are, like I said, they can't be traded. They must be met to the target. So infiltration control, there are specific levels based on climate zone that must be met um, and they can't be traded. So same thing with the ducts, the controls of the HVAC, piping insulation, the equipment sizing, dampers and the lighting. All of those are mandatory and cannot be traded. 
So let's talk about the compliance paths. As we start getting into a little more detail. There's two from the, there's three actual prescriptive compliance paths. There's the R value approach, which is basically you have for based on the climate zone, your envelope must meet specific R value requirements. If you, and they all must be met. If one component doesn't meet the R value requirements, the home does not comply. Similar to the U factor requirement, uh, trade off requirements, there allows a little bit more trade off um, in the U factor approach. And then the UA approach allows com trade off between components, envelope components. Um, so there's they're slightly different styles of approach, but each one, as we go down the line, allows a little more flexibility and trade off capability. So the simulated performance approach, here's where we're looking at the annual, annual performance of the building. And the annual performance of the design building is compared to a reference standard home that's defined by the code. So as long as your energy bills are less than the standard reference home, your building will comply. So this now we're adding a little more flexibility and trade-off capability. So if you, you're not so rigid in your prescriptive approach, but now we're allowing a little more design flexibility. The ERI is a specific, it's based on an asset rating, uh, a resident asset rating. And this is um, a measure of the efficiency of a home. So there are ERI targets that the home must meet in order to comply. And we'll, we'll get into the details of that. But this is based off the ResNet 301 standard, um, Residential Energy Services Network, ResNet. Um, they have a standard that you know, promulgates the ERI and how it is calculated. And there's one final uh, compliance path for any home that's in a tropical region. And this is in Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, more tropical zones, that this is a prescriptive approach that the home is allowed to comply it has some very specific requirements that we'll talk about later in this uh, in this discussion. So now we'll talk about well we'll get into the details now prescriptive compliance of all compliance paths. But right now we're going to talk about the prescriptive compliance. And we talk there's three types of compliance. There's the U factor compliance, the R value compliance, and the UA compliance. And these are basically looking sorry, looking at the envelope itself. So the envelope is defined as where is the thermal boundary of the building? As you can see, a couple different scenarios here where there may be the thermal boundaries in the attic, or maybe it's a little different <clears throat> uh, in you know showing the attic walls and the ceiling and the roof. So de depending on where the thermal boundaries define is where these, these compliances will come into play. So let's talk first about climate zones because this is an important piece of prescriptive compliance. The climate zones, there's eight climate zones, climate zone one through eight, um, starting at the warmer climate zones and then as the climate zones grow into the colder. Uh, so this would be climate zone seven or eight. These are the cold climate zones. There are two zero zones listed, but these are more um, international zones. There are no cl climate zone zeros. And the climate zone, is based on the climate zone number one through eight is based on heating degree days and cooling degree days. So the warmer climate zones uh, are down in the south, obviously, and then it goes into the colder climate zone. So as you can see, one through eight goes from hot down to cold um, and Arctic. There are also three moisture designations. Um, you got moist, which is climate zone in A. You have a dry climate zone, and you have a marine. So as you can see, the climate zones go, for, you know, have a number and then a, a, a moisture designation um, as well. There is also a humidity, humidity designation, which is not shown on this map, but it does go uh, right up in this area. And that uh, also has some effect on what, uh, when the prescriptive compliance of uh, what insulation requirements there are. And we'll talk about that next. So this is the prescriptive ta R value table. Um, this is table 402.1.3 right out of the uh, 2021 IECC. And you can see for each climate zone, you have the requirements for each envelope component from the windows, skylights, the ceiling, wood frame walls, mast walls, floors, basement walls, slabs, and crawl space walls. So each one of these has uh, an R value requirement. And the R values are, are in combinations. You could have a cavity 
um, insulation plus uh, continuous external insulation, or you could have some of these have just all cavity insulation, or you could have all continuous insulation. So there's a combination specific for the walls. So where a CI is listed, that is for continuous insulation, and the first numbers are typically for the R, uh, the cavity wall or cavity uh, insulation levels. So these are the requirements. So if you if a building owner chooses to comply with the R value prescriptive compliance, it could be as simple as a, uh, a checklist. So here's, I'm thinking of a building, there's a simple slab on grade um, home. So we have our wall value um, requirement, 20 plus five, a ceiling requirement of R60, and this is a, in climate zone five. So this is a, a more, this is a little bit cooler climate zone. Um, floor insulation is 30. You know, these are the requirements that the home must meet. Now, for the wall, we here we meet the wall requirement. Um, the ceiling, we're a little bit under um, than the required, 49 to um, the required of 60. Obviously, floor, mass wall, basement wall, crawl space wall, these are not applicable. It's a slab on grade home. And then we have a requirement of 15, R15 at four feet. Uh, the requirement is 10 at four feet. So we, we meet that. And then we're also the fenestration, the window, uh, U-factor and the solar heat gain coefficient. Um, we're doing a little bit better than the requirement. So we pass all of these. However, the ceiling roof insulation level um, is not uh, up, it's not meeting the minimum requirement. So it does fail. In this case, the entire building fails uh, because this is the rigidity of the R value prescriptive requirements is that every single component must pass. One fails, the whole building fails. So this would need to meet at least the minimum requirement for the building to pass. So that's, this is where I talk about, this is very uh, rigid. There's no uh, flexibility in the, in the compliance path. You meet all the requirements or it fail, the home fails. So this, the second uh, prescriptive compliance is U factor. So this gives a little more flexibility. Um, similar to the R value table, there's all, every component has a U factor. And the U factor is is a measure of the heat transfer uh, rate uh, based on per, per square foot of surface area per degree temperature change. So it's just a measure of that heat transfer rate. So the lower the U factor, the more insulative um, the surface is. So as you see in the climate zones, going from the warmer climate zones to the cooler climate zones, the U factors typically get lower, which means it needs requires more insulation. So a trade-off in here is is long. You could use any materials in your uh, in your component envelope component as long as the U factor met this level, it would comply. So there's no requirement of what materials you need to use, as obviously as long as they, if there are certain fire restriction requirements. But as long as the materials meet this U factor, uh, it will comply. So we have a similar table to the R factor compliance. So this is the same uh, slab on grade home in climate zone five. So now instead of looking at the uh, U factors, I'm uh, sorry, the R values, we're looking at the U factors. So it's the same home, same compliance. You'll see that all the U factors are meeting the compliance as we showed down here. They all meet, it's kind of similar to the R value. The one different, same thing is the ceiling is not meeting the requirement of this uh, of the of the of the minimum requirement that was for our R60 ceiling, so it does fail. So it's still again this home is gonna is not gonna pass until the proposed building the pros home increases the ceiling insulation at least to the minimum level. So again, this is still a pretty rigid compliance pathway, but you do have the you do have the ability to trade off. The components within the, the the materials within the component to get this U factor, but the overall the U factor must meet the minimum uh, U factor from the code. So these are the two pretty pretty rigid compliance pathways: the U fact the U factor and the R value. And there's one more, which provides a little trade off between components. Now itself is the UA compliance. So the UA is the U factor multiplied by the area of the surface. So 
specifically for a ceiling, it would be the U factor for a climate zone five that we've been looking at would be 0.024 multiplied by whatever the area is of the ceiling. That is its UA value. And so you sum up the UA values of the building and then that must be less than or equal to the UAs of the standard reference building. Uh, so I'll show you this table. This um, this is a table straight out of the ResCheck software compliant. So ResCheck software compliance uh, developed by PNNL um, for the use for the Building Energy Codes program. It is a it's a commercially available software, and this will conducts a UA trade-off analysis for a home. So as you can see, it lists all the components that are part of a home. You have two ceilings, walls, doors, windows, um, and a floor. So it kind of encapsulates an entire uh, thermal envelope. So we have the area of each component. We have the R values used in each of the assemblies. And then the calculated U factor from, these, from this design. So the proposed U factors are listed in this column. And then we also show the required U factors. And these are straight out of the, the U factor table that was in our last slide. And you could do a comparative knowing that if the proposed U factor is lower or equal to the required U factor, then it's in good shape. And so now we just have the simple proposed and required U fa UA values. This is literally this area times the proposed U factor. We get a proposed UA of 13. This area times the required U factor gives the 15 uh, for the required UA. So what we do is we sum up the entire list of proposed UAs and the required UAs and that's where we come up with the total. So in this case, maximum UA is 207. That's what is from the required column. 182 is the proposed home. So since this lower, it, it's better than code by 12.1%. So that's the idea behind the UA approach is in this case where we talked earlier about a ceiling that doesn't meet um, the U factor requirements, you could, still have that U factor that is not as, uh, doesn't meet the requirements on that one component, but you could make it up on other components. So if you had um, a really well insulated floor and a really well insulated walls, but your ceiling didn't meet the requirements, as long as in this case, as long as the proposed UA is lower than the required UA, this home will comply. So that's, this is where we talk about a little more trade-off is you can, over-insulate the walls, over-insulate the floor to make up for the lower insulation in the ceiling, and then this building would pass. So now we're gonna get into the performance compliance where this requires a little bit more, um, it's a little harder way to show compliance because it does require software analysis, perform, uh, simulated, simulating the operation of the building over a year. And it does require that there is testing involved, that you test the home for air leakage and that you test the ducts for um, leakage within the ducts themselves. And also that you're getting adequate ventilation um, from your mechanical ventilation. So this we'll talk about a little bit more how this encapsulates all the operations of the home, the heating and cooling equipment, uh, the ventilation, air leakage, um, internal, uh, internal loads such as the appliances everything goes into the model of the uh, for the performance compliance so like i said it requires computer simulation um, to determine you know what's the annual operating uh, cost for this building based on its design so it takes into account the operation the efficiency of the hvac equipment the thermal efficiency of the envelope the leakiness of the home the load of the compliances everything goes into uh, this analysis. So to comply, the proposed building, your design building, must have a lower or equal cost than the standard reference building. So the building designed to meet the just the minimum efficiency of, of the home. So again, this considers every all, let me back up. The, the compliance only looks at even heating, the cooling, the water heating, and ventilation energy. Even though we're still modeling appliances and plug loads, those don't go into 
the compliance. And so if you look on the right here, this is a report from uh, uh, Code Compliance Software. And you'll see we've got heating, cooling, water heating, and mechanical ventilation. So you'll see, and this is based on the 2018 code. So you've got 536 for the heating for the basically the base home. This is the standard home. And then you have $434 for the your proposed home. So you're you're doing better for heating. Um, on the cooling side, you're doing a little worse. You're a little more expensive on your design home than the reference home. Water heating, you're right in online. And with mechanical ventilation, we're about half the cost of the standard. So we subtotal that. We look at this is what compl the compliance is based on is the heating, cooling, water heating, and mechanical ventilation. So in this case, 781 of the cost for the design home is 900 for the standard reference home. This home would show it does comply. Um, and there's still something there, you know, the, the lighting and appliance and plug loads, there's still the cost there with total, but this is not what the code is gonna look at when it comes to compliance. It's only gonna be these end uses um, that's strictly from the code. And this also shows the mechanical, uh, the mandatory requirements, and we'll talk about those a little later. Um, in this case, this, you know, if some of these mechanic mandatory requirements were not met, um, even though this home performs much better, this home would fail um, its compliance for the performance path. So it's just again recouping on this. It's just a simple annual cost-based compliance path. As long as the your design home has a lower cost than the um, standard reference home, it will comply. The second performance compliance path is the energy rating index. Um, this is the same, you're running the same kind of computer simulation encapsulating the entire operation of the building. But in this case, your that design home is getting an ERI, energy rating index calculated based on the ResNet 301 standard. It just determines how you, based on the loads and the cost of the building and its operation, how the ERI is calculated. And so the ERI is an index. So 100 would equal kind of the, the 100 would be equal to a 2006 IECC home. And then the lower you go, that means the more efficient the home is. So if you get down, if the home gets down to a zero, that means that's a zero, basically zero energy home. So anything between zero and 100 is what you would see. And then the 2021 20, uh, IECC has targets. So in order to comply based on your climate zone, you must meet a specific target in order to show compliance. So uh, in all our examples, we were looking at climate zone five and that requires a ERI of 55 or less to, to comply. So here's a, a copy of a report from a beta, in beta version. They still haven't released the 2021 IECs yet, but this is allows us to look at a home and to see if it does comply. So you can see there's an ERI. Um, it gives two ERI scores, one with and one without PV. So in this case, given that this home does not have any PV, they're both the same. So the score of this home is a 78. And you can see this has the same end uses, heating, cooling, water heating, lights and plants, volovoltaics. The one difference is all end uses are used to calculate the ERI. When we talked about the performance uh, compliance path just previously, remember it was only heating, cooling, water heating, and ventilation. Lights and appliances and photovoltaics didn't come into play to calculate, uh, to determine that performance compliance. Here with the ERI, it takes all of the end uses into account to calculate the ERI. And as you can see, as I said, the 55 is the, the mark that we need to meet. And this is well off that mark. So it obviously, in this case, it would fail. So we would have to figure out ways to improve the efficiency of this home to get it down to a 55 for it to comply uh, with the ERI compliance path. So those are all the compliance paths. Um, Again, from starting from the prescriptive, going through to the performance and the ERI, it allows you a lot more flexibility, trading off across components and efficiencies and leakages, but it, it takes a little more uh, energy. You know, you're, you're, when you get into the performance compliance pathway, you're doing energy modeling. And in the case of the ERI, you would have to hire uh, an energy rater 
to do the modeling and the, the testing and the inspections for the home. So there's an added cost, but it does provide the flexibility um, to show compliance for the home. So the mandatory requirements, again, these are items that the, every home must meet regardless of the compliance path, regardless of um, how efficient it operates. Uh, even a zero energy home, proven zero energy home, must meet these uh, mandatory requirements. So it's there's thermal envelope requirements, there, there's mechanical requirements, and then there's electrical and lighting requirements. So all of these must be met um, in order for the home to comply, as well as proving the performance, either in the prescriptive or the performance compliance approaches. So some of the larger uh, requirements, some of these have a, a effect on either energy or comfort. Um, air leakage testing, um, this is a big knob, typically has a, a large effect on energy consumption and comfort. No one likes to sit next to a wall or window where there's air coming in and leaking on you. It's just, so this is a big one that, that is, you know, making sure that the home is tight um, and, and according to the requirements of the code. Um, windows, same thing. You want to make sure that these windows overall have a, a good U factor and solar heat gain coefficient. So it, it can control how much heat um, and solar insulation is coming through the windows. System controls, how, you know, how the, the thermostats and controls on the equipment must operate um, and what uh, capabilities they have. This is another big component. Duct leakage testing, similar to air leakage testing. This is a very big, this can have a, not only a comfort issue, but a performance issue. Um, uh, a furnace and air conditioner connected to a very leaky duct system is not gonna perform to its rated efficiency and the conditioned air that it's developed is not gonna get to the occupants in, in certain rooms. So there will be comfort issues as well. So this is a big one uh, uh, to, to make sure that it is done right. Piping insulation, ventilation and testing, lighting and lighting controls, these are some big uh, big knobs that we, the code wants to make sure that, that these are inspected, tested and made sure that they are performing um, as intended by the code. So early on, we talked about a tropical compliance. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the tropical regions such as Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, the US Virgin Islands, and Northern Mariana Islands, these obviously have very warm climates um, and moist climates. So they don't need to have uh, all the requirements that are for more continental US uh, locations. So, a home that complies through a trop, if there's a home in a tropical region, it must comply with all 11 of these requirements. Um, you know, saying that no more than half of the space can be conditioned. Uh, it's not heated. There are solar renewable requirements, window requirements, um, lighting requirements, the roof uh, requirements, fenestration requirements, bedrooms with stereo walls facing two different directions have operable fenestration. Um, interior doors and then ceiling fans must be in place. So it's as long as the home meets all of these and it's not conditioned more than half the space and no heating, it would comply with the with the code. So this is where you know if you know the the since the code requires the heating for most of the uh, the spaces in the continental U.S. having no heat here, uh, you know you wouldn't have to worry about showing an efficiency. It would comply. It must have no heating to comply with the tropical region. And this is new to the 2021 IECC. This has not been in any previous codes, but there's a, a section that requires uh, a 5% additional efficiency added to the building. So you can do it in one of five ways. Uh, you could have more advanced um, envelope performance, uh, more efficient HVAC, uh, reduce energy use in service hot water, get more efficient duct distribution, or improved air sealing. And there's specific requirements that, so if, if you're complying with a performance-based approach, you must show that you have met the requirements of one of these five. So if it was more efficient HVAC, it would be you'd had a 95 AFUE furnace and a 16 sear air conditioner, or you had a higher, you show that you had a higher efficiency water heating system, or that the envelope performed to a higher UA value, better 
UA value than the standard reference home um, to a 5% improvement. So each of these uh, states to have a 5% additional efficiency improvement. So if you, on the performance side, the code states that if you're doing a performance analysis, the R405 total building simulation performance, that is if you could either select one of the 5% uh, additional efficiency packages, or you could just show that your design home is 95% better. So there's, there's a 5% improvement than the standard reference home. So as long as you're at 95% or less than the standard reference uh, energy cost, this home would comply. So you can do it one of two ways. And similar with the ERI, as long as the ERI is 5% lower than the ERI target, this home would comply. So that's where there's a couple different ways that additional efficiency can be built in. There is a chapter on existing buildings. So for, to deal with alterations, additions, repairs, changes in occupancy, occupancy and relocation. So basically the simple way to put this is anything that's this, you know changed or modified within the building must meet the prescriptive requirements uh, of the code, um, chapter four code. So if you replace windows, those would need to meet the U factor and solar heat gain coefficients of the prescriptive tables. Um, if you uh, rebuilt a wall, uh, then that insulation would have to meet the requirements of the code. So basically anything that's touched or modified needs to meet the prescriptive requirements. There's no requirement to go to a full performance-based approach unless some jurisdictions add in that if a home is more, if more than 50% of the area of the home is modified, that they do need, that is almost treated as new construction and then the home whole, whole home must comply. But these are more local jurisdiction um, requirements kind of a added you know ways to catch you know large scale modifications so but for the standard code from the national level anything that's altered or um, changed or added onto must meet the prescriptive requirements of the code there are certain reporting requirements um, for the code so there's a, a compliance uh, a certificate which is here on the left which just shows kind of the simple uh, design specs of the home, the envelope, the window, sorry, and then the heating and cooling systems, and then a, a, a name and signature. So this is a, a certificate that typically would go on the uh, electrical panel of the home for when the code, the home was showed that it meet, met the compliance. There's always an inspection checklist requirement. So based on the design of the home and the specs that went into the home, that this could be generated by a compliance software to for the inspectors to go through and, and verify that what has been designed is actually been installed in the home. And then a typical overall compliance certificate, which I showed you earlier, was showing the UA analysis. This is straight out of the ResCheck software. Um, so showing that it does pass the, at least pass from a performance side, it passes the, the requirements of the code but then up to, it would be up to the inspectors to go through and verify that everything has met um, as it has been designed. And one final piece of the code is there are two appendices um, in the residential section. These appendices are for solar ready provisions and one for zero energy um, residential provisions. These are stretch code um, language to for any local jurisdiction that wanted to incorporate solar ready provisions or a zero energy requirement in their uh, in their community, they could literally adopt and make these appendices part of their state or local codes, and then they'd be required. So right now these are these are just stretch code opportunities available for local jurisdictions to add into their code. But unless any code has adopts these, these are just more informative um, and allow and available for anyone to use, adopt, and adjust. So that was a I've, that was a very brief, quick review of the compliance pathways and what's in the 2021 IECC. Um, I thank you for your time, and if there's any questions, let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for your presentation on the 2021 IECC residential provisions. 
Next up is Joe Neviat. Joe is a building science and regulatory analyst with Newport Partners, LLC. Joe, does, Joe is a codes expert, teaches code classes and participates in codes and standards development. He also serves as the operations director for the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program. Thank you, Mark, for that kind introduction. I'm happy to be here today to talk about above code programs and the different voluntary certifications out there, how they work uh, together with the code uh, to bring high performance homes to home buyers, uh, and also to talk about how they can uh, help improve construction beyond code and help builders to market that improved construction. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about some of the certifications that are available. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it is some of the main national ones that are out there. Um, uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about the, the federal programs, Energy Star, Certified New Homes, Indoor Air Plus, and Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Home. And I'll focus mostly on Zero Energy Ready Home because I have the, the privilege to serve as the operations director for that program. Um, uh, and I'll also mention some of these other programs as we go. But the, the nice thing about the federal programs are they work together uh, uh, in that they all require, as you as you get to higher levels, the the previous levels as prerequisites. So, to build an EPA Indoor Air Plus home, it has to also be certified Energy Star. To build a Zero Energy Ready home, it has to be certified to EPA Indoor Air Plus and Energy Star. Um, so, these are all voluntary certifications that require other certifications as part of their uh, as part of their program. And then there's a non-federal uh, program, FIAS, um, Passive House Institute US, has a certification that requires DOE Zero Energy Ready, Indoor Air Plus, and Energy Star as prerequisites. So each of these programs takes the building performance a little bit further down that efficiency and uh, indoor air quality and building science path and, and achieves better levels. Um, most of these programs are predominantly focused on the building's performance itself. There are also other programs that look even further into sustainability of materials, um, development, uh, recycle, uh, recyclable content, these sorts of things. Uh, and, and I think of these as more of the green programs. Um, and some of those would include LEED, uh, which has a uh, homes program lead version four, in fact, has 26.5 points that uh, are attributed to uh, zero energy ready home certification. So if you're getting some of these other certifications, they work well with the green programs out there. Um, Enterprise Green Communities, which has an affordability focus in addition to sustainability and energy, uh, also gives 12 points to Zero Energy Ready Homes uh, certification, and it, all, it gives points for, for FIAS and Energy Star as well. Um, so, so these programs are meant to kind of work together uh, as you achieve different levels. And then there's the National Green Building Standard, which can function as a code uh, if adopted that way, or as a voluntary certification program. And most of these programs, uh, the requirements of those programs will get uh, points certainly in the NGBS program. So uh, it's important to know that these work together, but that they focus on slightly different things and different jurisdictions have adopted them as requirements or give uh, sometimes rebates, that sort of thing for certification. Um, but what I want to focus on first is how these programs bring value and optimize the delivery of that value uh, to the builder uh, who's building in an advanced code environment. Um, so the first thing we think of with advanced code, you know, with, with older versions of the code, uh, these above code certifications added a lot of differentiation. In fact, it was in in those cases, it was often these homes built to cert above code certifications were delivering building science and and high performance where code maybe code minimum maybe wasn't. Uh, but as codes have advanced, uh, 
there there has been a even greater need for differentiation because the code minimum home is in fact quite advanced in the efficiency levels uh, that it's achieving um, and and uh, different aspects of home performance. Um, so these different certification programs can help builders, innovative builders in a market differentiate themselves by going beyond code uh, in a number of ways. I also think they help convert cost to value. So code uh, to an extent, adds costs. When we put a requirement in, that requirement is is often, not always, but often going to cost something. Um, but it can deliver value if done correctly. And what these above code programs help do is make sure that those, those uh, items that add cost are also done correctly. We know that, that building departments, uh, building inspectors around the country are um, incredibly strapped for time and resources. As the code has gotten more and more complex, their time to inspect maybe hasn't grown. Um, and that's, that's just the nature of, of, you know, jurisdictional budgets and these sorts of things. Uh, so what above code programs can help do is add a level of, of quality assurance and, uh, ensure that the the cost is actual to actually delivered to the homeowner or the occupant uh in a in a valuable way um in addition uh certification programs above code programs can also uh help ensure that the home has a whole house design so one of the aspects of code adoption around our country is that a jurisdiction might adopt say the 2021 energy code but still be on the 2009 version of the residential building code because they don't have to necessarily be adopted together. Um, and then what you might end up missing is certain aspects of improved ventilation rates or perhaps the, uh, the, the vapor barrier requirements that are intended to be uh, in partnership uh, with the insulation requirements. Uh, those don't end up going together if the, if you don't adopt the code as a package. Um, and then you could end up with some building science problems because of that. And what these, these um, above code programs do is help make sure that we're looking at the entire package so that the house will work as a system well. Uh, and then finally, we add a, a third party inspection aspect that can help code enforcement in some cases. These third party inspectors are also being used as actual code enforcers uh, around the country uh, if the jurisdiction wants to do that. But it can also add just additional quality assurance by adding another inspection on top of the code inspection to make sure that this is uh, done correctly, that things are done correctly. So again, I'm going to focus mostly on the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home, but I'll talk a little bit about the prerequisite programs that are that are involved um, and how these programs help deliver that value. Um, Zero Energy Ready Home was launched version one in 2013, and we're currently on revision seven. But we do have a public review draft for our version two out for comment. Uh, so please do. Uh, uh, take a look at that and comment if you get it a few moments. We'd love to hear from people and what they think. Uh, we also, and I know this is important for, for audiences thinking about multifamily construction, we have a multifamily specification in process that we hope to have out for public review by the end of the year. Currently, multifamily buildings up to five stories can qualify under version one of our program. Uh, we're working on a, a multifamily specification that will work for buildings of all, all heights, all story uh, numbers. Um, again, out for public review by the end of the year is, is our goal. Uh, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, one of the main ways I think above code programs and certifications help uh, the, the home built in an advanced code environment is through ventilation. So code does require whole house mechanical ventilation 2012 it uh it, the the code introduced building air tightness air tightness requirements in a mandatory way and they tied that ventilation to the building air tightness targets now there was a little loophole where if you hit five air changes per hour exactly uh at 50 pascals and you didn't have to ventilate um 
in 2015, that loophole went away. But then a lot of states adopt, amended their code so that maybe you didn't have to deliver um, mechanical ventilation when you were building a pretty tight home, like maybe they allowed up to six ACH 50, which is really too tight to not be ventilating. Um, but the code was only requiring it at five or lower. Um, the 2021 code has fixed some of those loopholes as well. Uh, but again, people don't always adopt codes together. And so, so it's important to look at these above code programs for this. And Energy Star, one of the prerequisites for zero energy ready, requires ASHRAE 62.2 ventilation rates for all certified homes. This is the primary way that ASHRAE 62.2, which is the leading ventilation standard in this country, is introduced uh, into new homes. The, the uh, rates in the IRC are, are slightly lower. Um, than ASHRAE 62.2. And so this is this is the main way that that homes will will see this standard for um, minimum ventilation. In addition to that, Energy Star actually tests the flow rates. The inspectors test them on site. That's not something that happens uh, in in most code uh, inspections. Uh, and then finally, Indoor Air Plus has ventilation requirements during construction and pre-occupancy to get rid of some of the off-gassing of materials and construction uh, equipment that happens. Uh, code does have requirements for kitchen exhaust, but it still allows recirculation, um, which is, uh, from, from an indoor health point of view, not ducting the kitchen exhaust to the outside is one of the major contributors to health problems related to indoor air quality uh, in this country. Uh, so Energy Star does require the kitchen exhaust to be ducted to outdoors, verified flow rates of that kitchen exhaust. Um, so that's an important aspect. Again, code will allow uh, bathroom ventilation and window trade-off still um, in a lot of jurisdictions. So if I have an operable window in a bathroom, I don't have to put the bath fan in. If you've ever been in one of those bathrooms where there's a shower that's being taken, uh, you, you notice how humid it gets in there, mainly because people don't open that operable window, especially if it's, if it's cold outside, if it's really hot outside, they're not going to open the window and try to get rid of some of that humidity. And then you have moisture problems indoors. Energy Star does require the exhaust, uh, the, the bathroom exhaust, and verified flow rates. And then... Um, in addition to that, code does deal with efficiency of ventilation systems. Uh, they look at CFM per watt. So how much air are we moving per uh, an amount of energy? And in the 2021 IECC, there is a requirement for heat or energy recovery ventilators in uh, climate zones 7 and 8. So the colder climate zones, uh, not, not everywhere in the country, but some places, and that's uh, an efficient balanced ventilation system. Our draft for version two of Zero Energy Ready is looking at requiring uh, those uh, heat and energy recovery ventilators in an expanded area, climate zone six to eight. Um, and our current version of the, of the program requires Energy Star bath fans. So there's an efficiency aspect to our, to our ventilation. Again, in a, in a modern home that's built Anything tighter than 10 ACH 50, good ventilation isn't optional. Really, 14 or 15 ACH 50, you start getting into the danger zone where we need to start bringing in fresh air, controlling our fresh air. We can't have um, uh, non-functioning ventilation systems. This is just a little picture of a, of a kind of uh, do-it-yourself recirculation system in a house I, I found once with a coffee can and a, a fan. And um, anyway, not meant to be a real installation in the field, but, um, but this sort of thing obviously is not gonna provide good fresh air in a modern house. Pollutant control is another thing we need to think about in an advanced code environment where we have very tight houses, we need to think about what pollutants are going into the houses and above code programs can help with that. Um, code doesn't do a lot with pollutant source control. Uh, Energy Star, however, requires filters. So uh, things like particulate matter, accessible filters so that they can be changed. Um, we'll, we'll get rid of some of the indoor pollutants. Um, indoor Air Plus requires a minimum MERV-8. That's not a really advanced 
filter. You can get those pretty, pretty readily, but it will do um, some good uh, at getting rid of some indoor pollutants. Um, they also, Indoor Air Plus requires a low emission uh, carpets, cabinets, um, composite wood products, paints, low VOC paints, uh, in addition to some controls on radon and pest uh, protections. And then finally, uh, Indoor Air Plus requires no building cavity ducts, so no panned returns, no two studs with a couple pieces of drywall acting as a duct, really bad indoor air quality in those spaces, and they're very hard to seal uh, from an efficiency point of view. So these are these are all ways that that these programs help to make code homes better. This one's actually no building cavity ducts has been in the code, excuse me, but uh, but it, it has been amended out in a number of local jurisdictions. Um, so it's it's important to to keep it in those above code programs. And then for version two of zero energy ready home, we're considering a MERV 13 filter requirement and that will deal uh, better with particulate matter in the house and then also some viral uh, um, filtration will happen at the MERV 13 level. We also really want to think about bulk moisture control when it comes to uh, to a, a home built to any advanced code. We have less drying potential because uh, there's less heat moving across the building envelope, less air leakage. Uh, so we have to control that moisture. And so bulk moisture, capillary reaction at the at the foundations, vapor control, knowing where our dew point is, uh, and then also controlling air leakage because in a humid environment, if air is moving across the envelope, moisture is probably moving as well. Um, so we want to be able to control that so we don't end up with a, a moisture problem in the house. Code has limited moisture control. It does have some vapor barrier requirements, which are important, some flashing requirements as well. Energy Star uh, adds quite a lot of, of bulk moisture control. And then these things are actually getting inspected, uh, capillary break control and vapor control. Indoor Air Plus adds additional measures beyond this, uh, things like gutters and splash protection. Um, Indoor Air Plus also adds humidity control, de whole house dehumidification in some of the more humid environments uh, in the southeast and, and south of the country. Um, the code also attempts to control uh, air sealing, and it does a pretty good job. 3ACH50 has been a mandatory target for some time. 2021 allows some trade-offs up to 5ACH50, um, but but that's still a pretty airtight house. Um, and, and it's a house that at 3ACH50 is still a challenge for some builders to meet, but, but um, in states where it's been a requirement for a while, they've figured it out. Uh, Zero Energy Ready Home version one has had a uh, air tightness target of 1.5 to 3 ACH 50, depending on the climate zone. Version two, uh, similar, but we're down to 2.75 ACH 50 in some of those warmer climates. Um, again, having a, a better target than code, but uh, there is some flexibility to trade off as long as you're you're meeting those air tightness requirements uh, up to the code level. But it's it's hard to make that up in a building model. So most builders are are hitting these targets. In fact, some of our builders in the Zero Ready program are hitting 0.6 ACH50 on a production level. Uh, there's one custom builder I know of who's hitting 0.11 ACH50. So a lot of builders are hitting very tight air tightness targets, and this is stopping um, a lot of moisture movement across that envelope. And that's great as long as we're ventilating those spaces correctly. Code does provide some pretty good protection from a thermal uh, control value, right? Uh, as we've gone from 2009 uh, to 2021 code, we've seen a lot of increases in insulation amounts, right? Um, there is a lot of flexibility in the code, uh, less as it's gotten more stringent, but uh, the, a builder could use an R value, a U value, or a whole building U area weighted UA uh, trade off where they're, you know, moving insulation around that sort of thing, uh, as long as they're meeting the whole building uh, U value target. Uh, so there's some flexibility there. Windows the same way. Uh, 
But then code also allows for more flexibility with different performance paths. So if I'm using one of the performance paths in the code, maybe I don't have the envelope that building envelope that's as robust in thermal control as it's written in the code tables. Maybe it's a less efficient envelope and I've added efficiency somewhere else in one of these um, performance paths. Uh, so while the code does establish some thermal control, um, you're not necessarily assured of a of a robust thermal uh, envelope um, in a code built home. What programs like Zero Energy Ready Home and Energy Star and, and FIAS try to do is uh, ensure that that building envelope is built really well. And uh, in version one of Zero Energy Ready Home, we've had 2015 IECC uh, insulation requirements as a minimum. Um, they can still use R value U or UA, so there's some flexibility, but they can't hit an overall performance target and be worse than that whole building UA uh, than 2015. Uh, and, and, and those insulation values are the same in 2012 and 2018 as well. Um, but our version two specification is looking to update. We have a modern code with 2021 IECC that has very aggressive insulation levels uh, in a lot of areas. And so we're, uh, we're looking to add that as our, as our new backstop. So while the 2021 code will allow some trade-offs here, again, with different performance paths, we're going to require that uh, certified homes would be uh, meeting this envelope level. They could still do a UA, you know, if they don't want to do the R60 in the attic, they could they could add insulation somewhere else. They could put in a triple pane window, that sort of thing, um, and and trade that off. Uh, but the whole building UA would still need to be pretty robust. This is just a quick shot of our window requirement. We do require Energy Star windows. Uh, these are not really aggressive targets for the most part. Uh, as you can see here, this is actually now North Central and South Central. That's code in a lot of areas now. Um, but in version two, we are looking at a 0.25 U factor for a window in climate zone six to eight. And that's a, a fairly aggressive, still not as good as some of the triple pane windows are getting, but it's a fairly aggressive window. And we do have um, window targets as well that are a little bit different than the minimums um, that, that help to define how efficient the home needs to be. So you know, that's that's some of the ways that that these above code programs uh, add efficiency, add different measures to help um, the code built home be better and actually deliver. Um, but I want to talk a little bit now about cost and lost opportunity. So if the code says I need to put in R21 and let's just use that as an example. That's what's done here in this picture. Um, the homeowner has to pay for that, right? That amount of insulation is going to be paid for. How much more cost would be added to install this insulation in this picture correctly instead of compressed and crammed in? Um, it will take a little bit more time to do it right, although if you're doing it right on every job, it probably doesn't take that much longer. Um, this, In this case, they're actually using more insulation than they needed because they didn't cut it to fit. Uh, so they're they're using more material than they need. But the homeowner has paid for R21 in its window. That's what the code requires uh, in, in its walls. That's what the code requires and that's what they, they have to, um, the builder has to deliver. But because this may or may not uh, have a ha, the the local jurisdiction may or may not have time for a uh, sufficient inspection to look at details like this. This could get passed, um, perhaps. This is not code compliant, by the way. But but again, um, how much time do local jurisdictions have? Some have a lot of time. Some not so much. Um, so what the above code programs will help do is make sure that this doesn't happen so that I don't have a wall that's performing it maybe in R13 or 15 because of the compression while I'm paying for an R21. Same thing here. Um, we've got windows on the right and left where insulation has been cut and fit around the, the windows. Um, again, not allowed by code, uh, but it's done by almost every window install that I see in the field. 
And so if it's happening that often, that tells me that this is not something that's getting inspected regularly. How much more would it cost to caulk this? I think it actually costs less because it takes less time than cutting these strips of insulation and stuffing them in. And the insulation is not doing anything. It's not stopping air leakage and it's compressed. So it's not stopping thermal flow across the building envelope. So it's not code compliant. It's not being done correctly. And it actually costs more to do it this way. But now the homeowner has cold spots and air leaks around their windows. So they, we've lost the opportunity to deliver a high performance home to this uh, to this homeowner. And in the middle, it, that's a, uh, a rim joist there that's uninsulated. They missed behind the, uh, the duct register. And this was, you know, missed in a code inspection. So these sorts of things are the type of things that I think above code programs with their third party inspections will help um, actually catch these problems and deficiencies and correct them before the home is finished so that the, the homeowner is paying for what they're actually getting. And I think I'm, I've got just a few minutes left here. So I want to talk about, uh, real quick, some other high-performance items in, in above-code programs, ducts and conditioned space currently required by Zero Energy Ready Homes. This is an option in code, uh, but it's an option that makes a lot of sense. It helps to optimize that, that first cost opportunity of putting something in the right place and not having to move it later, which is a lot more expensive if you want to improve that performance. Again, Indoor Air Plus requires no building cavity ducts. That is in the code, but it does get amended a fair amount by local jurisdictions. Energy Star windows can help um, uh, a builder with code compliance, depending on what compliance path they're doing. That gives them a little bit more efficiency that may give them flexibility somewhere else. Um, and then third-party inspections, uh, as required by all of these programs, uh, HVAC commissioning, uh, actually inspecting the, the uh, building thermal envelope. These are all things that will help uh, give better assurance of the actual performance of the home as opposed to what's on paper for code. Here are our efficiency targets we're proposing for version two of the, of the program. Um, again, in the sort of in the, the high to mid 40s uh, for, a hertz, uh, for an energy rating index. Um, across the country, and, and each of those targets will, will be different house to house. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about affordability, because this is not, uh, these programs are not only for luxury custom-built houses. They're also uh, meant to provide affordable housing um, to homeowners that need that, to occupants that need it. This is a, a project in California, workforce housing project uh, used combined air to, to water heat pumps and uh, that that work for heating, cooling and water heating, and then also added LED lighting and energy star windows. It was zero energy ready home certified. Um, this is a phase two of the same project. They switched to ductless mini splits and heat pump water heaters. Um, other than that, it was basically the same approach. Um, this is an interesting project in Michigan at a Habitat for Humanity affiliate. They were making their own insulated concrete forms on sites. It, insulated concrete form typically comes in a manufactured block. It's two, two layers of foam, and then it's filled once it's assembled with, uh, with concrete for a really strong and well-insulated envelope. This group used uh, uh, rigid foam insulation that they had donated in order to make an affordable uh, insulated concrete form there on site. This is another Habitat affiliate, used ductless mini splits, heat pump water heaters, rigid and spray foam insulation, LED lights uh, in Florida to give a, uh, a, a affordable home that was also affordable to operate. Uh, this home in Long Island by United Way of Long Island was uh, a veteran, disabled veteran housing, um, used a number of things, energy recovery, ventilation, a number of different insulation approaches for a, a super efficient house. Same organization did a uh, uh, deep energy retrofit on this home. It's used for a homeless group housing. Um, again, different types of insulation, triple pane windows, ground source heat pump. So very efficient house, and it's all done uh, at an affordable price point to the to the um, 
organization that's providing it. This is a, another house that was done for a veteran uh, in Texas. Um, again, an affordable project, use SIP walls, ductless mini splits, energy recovery, ventilation, and energy star windows. Uh, and, and the point here is that we're trying to provide operational efficiency in addition to first cost, um, first cost, low cost products for affordable housing. Uh, there are a number of programs, state housing programs that are either considering zero energy ready or have already adopted us into their qualified assistance program. Rhode Island has uh, the program listed in the, their stretch code. And then there are rebates in a few states like Connecticut and New Jersey as well for certification. Um, one, one point I want to hit before I end here is that Again, these homes are not just luxury homes. The average zero energy ready home certified under this program is under 2,000 square feet. They're not huge. Uh, and there are a number of different affordable, uh, affordable builders and organizations working uh, in the program already to deliver affordable housing uh, that's also high performance and that go goes beyond code and helps support code by actually delivering that value in the field. So it's been my pleasure to talk to you today about above code programs, how they work with the code and help to improve uh, construction around the country. If you have any questions, I'm happy to talk to you at any point. Here's my contact information. Uh, and it's been uh, uh, just my joy to be here with you today and talk about these things. Thank you very much. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you, Joe, for that very informative presentation. And Rob, thank you as well for yours. Uh, wonderful content being shared today. Lots of lots of uh, goodies for us to take home. And for those of you that might have joined us late or want to know a little bit more about this, uh, check back with us. In about two weeks, we're going to upload uh, this this presentation or this this recorded uh, presentation to our HUD YouTube page. Uh, so stick with us. Now, let's see. Before I get started, we have some questions for our two panelists, but I will encourage our audience to once again submit any question you would like, and I will jump right to it. Oh, see? Look, that's perfect. Uh, Brian submitted a question, and I'm going to get right to it. So if anybody else has one, feel free to submit, and we'll get to it. Uh, let's jump right in. We have about 15, 16 minutes here. So Brian wants to know, is it appropriate to use the commercial part of IECC for existing high-rise apartment buildings? Or is there another code and standard that we should be looking at when making energy conservation upgrades for greater than three-story residential buildings? Yeah, I can take that. This, um, yes, th typically the residential code handles low, uh, low-rise multifamily. So that's three stories or less. So anything that is above three stories as a mid-rise or high-rise would be under the, the auspices of the commercial IECC. Great. All right. Seeing no more questions popping in, I'm going to go to my little list. And Rob, I've got a question for you first. Uh, what resources are available to determine the energy code adapted, adopted in my jurisdiction? Any good resources out there? You could go to the... Uh, energycodes.gov website. Um, and there we have uh, links to showing across country, state by state uh, adopted codes. Um, and these uh, show the what the adopted code is and also basically how it performs. Um, there's a lot of states that do indeed adopt a specific code and they um, amend it sometimes Rarely to increase energy efficiency, but most of the time, unfortunately, to reduce the, the stringency of the code. So what we show on our state adoption maps is how the state code performs relatively to earlier codes. So if a, even though a state may adopt a 2018 IECC and amend it uh, for less stringency, it may perform equally to the 2009 IECC. And so that's what is shown on the state code maps. If I could just add, the, there's really no substitution at the end of the day to going to your local building department and getting confirmation of what they have adopted on the books. And, and the resources Rob talked about are, are great for that big picture analysis and kind of feedback on what states are doing. But sometimes a state adopts something and then a county adopts something slightly different depending on the laws in that state. And maybe 
you're allowed to amend the energy code, but not the building code. And so I always stress, talk to your local building department, because sometimes there's a slightly different detail and you might get in trouble just looking at the summary resources. Totally agree there. The best weatherman I know is the guy standing right there on the ground. Uh, all right, we got some more questions popping in here. Uh, cool, thank you, everybody. So Jeff wants to know roughly what percent of energy performance improvement can be expected uh, comparing the, uh, I'm assuming that's 2010 IECC to the 2021 version? Um, that probably would be the 2012 uh, every three year code cycle. So, uh, to, you know, we have at PNNL, we have a performance, a progress indicator uh, that we've been keeping track of since the 1975 code up to the latest 2021 IECC. So looking at my graph, you know, the, our latest determination analysis showed that um, the 2021 IECC, it will be just around 9% more efficient than the 2018. And then from the 2012, um, there really wasn't much improvement. So it's, I would say in the order of about 10%, 10 or 11%. Looks like Jeff's going to follow up. He's at, he says specifically comparison between 2021 and 2021 in Zone Five. Uh, that's that's a little <laughs> granular, specific question. Uh, I could have that answer. It's um, uh, give me a minute. And I could probably pull it up, uh, but it's probably going to be a little bit higher uh, because in Climate Zone Four and Five there was an added uh, uh, R five continuous insulation requirement in the prescriptive pass. So it might be a little bit higher, but I can, uh, we do have that analysis and I can check. Great. And you know, that's, that's the wonderful thing about these webinars. Uh, Jeff can reach out to all of us if he needs to after the webinars, we've all put our contact information yeah. up there. So keep the questions coming. Uh, yeah, Jeff, I'm sorry. I, I <laughs> 2012 and 2021 in zone five. And I think that makes a little bit more sense. Um, but let me move on. I got an anonymous question. What's the crosswalk between commercial section of the IECC for four plus stories and the ASH RAE 90.1? Would you use the former versus the latter? What's that? I think he's asking the difference between ASHRAE 90.1 and commercial IECC. Uh, okay. Um, it, you know, the quick answer is depends on your jurisdiction, what they're uh, accepting. Um, sometimes, you know, they may want the 90.1 or the IECC. Most times they, they, they will ask for both. When typically ASHRAE leads the, the code development cycle where um, the latest was the 90.1 2019. So the tw IECC 2021 pretty much has the same, pretty close to equal provisions of the, the 1990.1 2019. So it's just a matter of your, yeah, what's, um, what's accepted in your jurisdiction. In fact, the IECC references 90.1 yeah. um, as an alternative pathway, but not all jurisdictions will, will do that. All right, let's see. I am going to, oh, here's a good one. Uh, Joe, where can we access the DOE RES check compliance software? And is it accepted by any jurisdiction? I think Rob might have some comments on that too, but DOE actually has now a web version of res check live. Um, mm -hmm. And I would just Google res check and it takes you right there. I don't know the URL off the top of my head, but um, I use it just the other day. It's very easy to access. You don't have to download anything. Uh, as far as whether jurisdictions will accept it, most do. Uh, again, ResCheck is really doing a, a UA compliance check. So that's what you're using that tool for. Um, there are some jurisdictions I've seen that, that specifically say code compliance must be done with such and such software. So every once in a while, I do see it where you, you might get a question about whether you can use it, but I think most allow it. Yes, most, most should allow it. And it's under the energycodes.gov site as well. There's links to ResCheck and ComCheck. Great, great resources. So here's one I thought was interesting that came in. So 
You've highlighted the value of the above code programs very well, but tell us about the cost. Approximately how much more would I expect to pay to meet the, the zero H? Yeah, so uh, it, that's a funny question. We do get it a lot. Um, I don't know that the answer is necessarily always going to be relevant. And what I mean by that is the national studies we do are never relevant to your specific situation. But um, both Energy Star and Zero Energy Ready uh, do a, a cost analysis uh, compared to code. And the last one I think was done in 2015. So obviously we're, we're updating stuff uh, to new versions and, and that'll have to be done again. But that analysis showed, I think Energy Star was somewhere between 1500 to $2,500 above code and Zero Energy Ready was between three and $5,000. Again, for a typical home, national average costs, all that sort of thing. The other thing I'll add is that as, as builders do these programs, there's a learning curve. So the first time you do one, the cost might be what I talked about in that study that we did. But the builder, for example, who I talked about, the production builder who's hitting 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ACH 50 on every home for 300, they've just cut a ton of costs out of their out of their processes going around and caulking, you know, and, and trying different products. The first time you have to put in a, a, a more efficient hot water system, there's some redesign that has to happen. There's a cost to that. But every other time you don't have to. Um, and, and so, and then there's some items like advanced framing, um, actually caulking instead of stuffing fiberglass around windows, it costs less at, at the end of the day. So there is some added cost builders get better at it. Three to 5,000 is a fine, no, fine number to use from a national average point of view. All right, let's see, where are my other good ones here? Oh, here's one for you, Rob. In a retrofit scenario, what happens if my building design does not allow me to meet the mandatory energy code requirement? What do I do? Um, you'd have to, you know, depending on what um, in the retrofit, if it's, um, there are certain pres you know, prescriptive requirements on the envelope, uh, the lighting, um, uh, me mechanical equipment. So I guess you're, it's the, re unfortunately the, perform the, the prescriptive requirement path is pretty rigid. So if, you know, if you're only touching windows, replacing windows, you need to meet that those prescriptive requirements. There's really no wiggle room or trade-off that you can do uh, between the windows. They all have to meet that code. So unfortunately, you must improve the stringency depending on that retrofit. All right, bring it up to scale. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, performance compliance pathway. Can I use the performance compliance pathway in a retrofit scenario? Uh, typically no, but um, it depends, you know, straight looking at this code, straight code, you are just need in a retrofit scenario, you're just, you know, complying with what has been either retrofitted or added. Um, the, re the original building doesn't really have to comply. There are some, I know my local jurisdiction states, if your retrofit is over 50% of the conditioned floor area, then it's basically the whole building must comply to the code. So in that case, yes, you could use the performance path to, uh, to comply the entire home. But typically the performance path is whole, the entire building compliance where in a retrofit, typically you're only, you know, right. affecting a small portion of the building. So in those, most of the cases performance, it's, you're going to be using the prescriptive approach. You, there also is a provision in a lot of jurisdictions that says if you can demonstrate that the new building will use less than or equal to the energy of the old building, then the code provisions may not apply. Most of the time, that's a lot more work and cost to model the building than to just, if I'm changing out windows, put in windows that are compliant. Okay, so we've got a question from Michael in the chat and it has parts to it, but let me get to the first part here. So. Uh, the crosswalk between the 2021 IECC and certain green building standards. There's, um, there is an allowance in the code for uh, above code programs that basically states if a third party official 
deems if if the home is proven to meet uh, certain above code programs, uh, uh, you know, agreed to by the code official, then that home is going to deemed in compliance with that specific code. So if the homeowner is built to something like a lead for homes um, and national green building uh, system that and the, the local code official approves that, then by that term that that home could be in compliance with uh, with the code. And I stress the part about if approved by the local code official, because a lot of them don't. Um, so it would be great from a process point of view if they did, but, um, but a lot of them want to get into details of does this meet all the provisions of the code. And uh, I found that many jurisdictions want you to go through their process and not hand them a certification. Some do. Um, that I, yeah, so some do. Okay, uh, Michael, if we answered your question, wonderful. If you have follow-up uh, questions, feel free to type them in that chat. I'm sorry I didn't get to the, the whole body of the, the question there. I, think um, I could just kind of look, sorry, yeah, sure, sure. I more just looking at the question itself. Yeah, see, the passive house is definitely more comparable, I'm sorry, more efficient than the 2020 IECC. Um, it's, you know, when I talk about, you know, we're, we're looking at, PNL is looking at, you know, uh, targeting for future codes and what's the glide path to net zero by 2030. And, you know, we're using FIAS as a kind of one of the benchmarks in our targeting, and it's quite a bit more efficient. Um, and one of our first targets is looking, how can 2021 get halfway to the efficiency of the passive house is kind of our first target. And then the Energy Star certified homes are typically, Energy Star is typically 10 to 15% more efficient than the latest uh, model energy code. So don't know exactly the number, but it should be in that range. That's right. They're the, in, in the next version of Energy Star, they are targeting that 10% above 2021 and uh, zero energy ready home is targeting approximately 20% above the 2021 for our version two. All right, thank you, gentlemen. And Mark, if I may, just to kind of finish off Jeff's original question about climate zone five, you know, looking at our analyses with the 2020, 2018 compared to the 2021, climate zone five showed an 8.5% improvement. That's 2018 to the 2021. For 2012 to 2021, climate zone five showed a 9.64% improvement. So that's as granular as we can get in a national base. And that's, in the, and that's a national level uh, analysis. So just wanted to kind of get that in. All right, uh, David, I read your question in the chat and I can tell you uh, just from the HUD perspective that we don't know yet. Uh, we, since it hasn't been passed, we, we haven't gotten into the nitty gritty yet. Uh, but I, obviously this is where I plug, you know, check back with us in, in two or three weeks and stay, stay abreast of all our wonderful activities and, and things. Um, so thank you for your question. All right, Michael, Jeff, I, we got Brian's. Uh, let's see, let me skip over here. I think this is a, to either one of you. Uh, foam installations insulations are difficult to recycle. In your professional opinion, are there concerns with new code requiring higher levels of insulation resulting in more foam continuous insulation in our buildings? And the alternative pass also was a follow-up. Hmm. Uh, Joe? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I don't wanna particularly dump on any particular technology, but um, I think the question you're getting at is um, complicated. And it's something that really we're just starting to look at things like embodied carbon in a building, recyclable content. The, the green programs have thought about this for a while. So LEED, NGBS, um, Enterprise Green Communities will have some stuff about the content in the buildings. The efficiency programs, not as much. Um, I guess it's, a, it's an important discussion to have. I think it's maybe less immediate than cutting the operational uh, energy and therefore carbon of the building. And I think that in my opinion, just from a hierarchy of importance point of view, if we're building homes that are so good that they're gonna last 200 years because we've built them right and they're not gonna have moisture problems and they're not gonna have indoor air quality problems and they're gonna be durable 
and installed correctly, I'm not sure how much I compare about recycling that foam board on the outside. But if you do care about it, and that's a priority, again, it, you know, sort of recyclable content um, for you, there are alternatives like, you know, there's co rigid cork insulation that you could use instead of a foam uh, on the exterior. You can do a double wall with blown in fiberglass that has a continuous break between the two studs then instead of having it to the exterior. So yes, there are alternatives if you don't want to use that material. Okay, uh, you know what? I, we're at time, but I, I, I'm gonna have to get to Mike's question. I wanna make sure we get all our audience members. So the bonus material for everybody attending the webinar today. Uh, Rob indicated when renovating an, an existing home, it is necessary to meet current requirements, but don't the walls and the ceilings only need to have cavities filled regardless if it meets the current required R value? Um, I think it depends, on, depends, yes, but depends on the climate zone as well. Um, for a wall, you know, once you, once you disturb that wall, open it up, um, it is, you know, now being required to meet the require the code whatever the adopted code is for the jurisdiction. So, some walls and climate zones have a you know R twenty plus a, a continuous insulation uh, layer. But so, but there are the code allows for very you know you could have all cavity insulation if there's enough in, you know space if you have enough width to fill in the cavity and not require to zero, uh, the continuous or you could have an empty cavity and have everything on the the exterior of the framing. So there's, it gives you some variability on how you want, you know, combination of cavity and continuous or all one or the other, if, if there's space. So there, there, there are ways to determine, you know, with the insulation and maybe the current insulation in that wall, you open it up and it's code level, close it back up. Yes, that's fine. That, that'll meet the code requirements. I haven't seen the 2021 language, but at least through 2018, there was an exception that said, as long as the cavity is filled in the wall, um, that's as far as you had to go. Now, how you interpret whether you're taking stuff off on the outside, do we then have to add continuous? That's less clear to me in the code. But if I'm just opening an interior cavity, the code, at least through 2018, would allow me to, to just fill it. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah. There's a lot of variability interpretation. So as we've mentioned earlier, check with the code official, and he will have the he has the final voice. You know, <laughs> their word is is what is going to be needed to heed, need to be heeded. I I've seen some jurisdictions that will say I've got a two by four. You have to fill it, but with an R15 because that's the most you could get in there, as opposed to an R13, which would fit the same space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so check with the local uh, and, and make sure you're, you're in good standing with your code. All right, so I think we're at time now, a couple minutes over, but I, I really wanna take this opportunity to, to thank Joe, Joe and Rob. I, those were fantastic presentations. Uh, our audience appreciates your knowledge. Uh, we appreciate the audience being here. So thank you everybody for attending. Um, we, we have contact information up for the, for the two panelists, and we're going to put this webinar up on the HUD YouTube channel. Um, so this is my opportunity to say thank you for everybody, for HUD, uh, DOE, and for our panelists, for our attendees, for, for attending the Innovations and in Energy Efficiency webinar series. Uh, we look forward to working with everybody in the future, and if you have extra questions, uh, feel free to reach out to any one of us. But it was our pleasure hosting this event this week, and we look forward to doing wonderful things together with you in the future. Uh, with that said, I will wish everyone a wonderful afternoon, afternoon, and thanks again for attending. Take care, thanks, everyone. everyone.